Hello, 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 and welcome to Miss Hope's Reading Hour on this fabulous Friday. It is Friday. Happy Friday to you all. Thank you so much for being here. So glad that you are here with me this evening. Hopefully you had a wonderful week. Unfortunately, you did not get to see me. I did not get to see you on Wonderful Wednesday. Remember, on Marvelous Monday, I told you it was a possibility that you wouldn't see me on Wonderful Wednesday. And it turned out I wasn't able to get home in time to do the broadcast. But I missed you guys. Miss Brandy, she did ask me today. She said, so why could you not be there on Wednesday? I had to let her know. Unfortunately, I didn't get home in time enough to do the broadcast. So, you know, I didn't want to just be rushing and trying to do stuff. I want to give you guys the best on Miss Hope's reading hour. So I had to say, oh. Sorry, no Miss Hope's reading hour on Wonderful Wednesday, but hopefully your Wednesday was wonderful. I know here in Philadelphia on Wonderful Wednesday, we have our half days on Wednesdays because once they started going hybrid, it switched from Friday to Wednesday. Also, um, Wednesday, the weather was awesome. Okay, super sunny, felt great outside. Miss Hope gets cold a little easy, so I was a little glad that I wore my hoodie, my school hoodie that I got from my school. Um, but the weather was beautiful. So hopefully on Wonderful Wednesday, if you weren't, since you weren't with me, you got to get outside, do some fun stuff, yesterday also very very nice weather yesterday now today it's getting a little cooler here because it's gonna possibly rain on saturday and sunday but guess what we are here we are together we have some awesome books and so that means that the friday is still fabulous my friends okay so I'm so glad to be back with you all. I always miss you guys when I'm not able to be on. But I knew I was coming back with Fabulous Friday. So I'm glad that I'm here with you all. Now, let us get our disclaimer out of the way. All of the wonderful music that you'll hear and the great, awesome books that we will read. Unfortunately, Miss Hope and Miss Hope's Reading Hour do not own the rights to them, but guess what they are here for? Your listening and reading enjoyment, okay? So, we have gotten that out of the way. Now, I wanted to read you a little message that came from one of the friends of Miss Hope's Reading Hour. She's actually my cousin, okay? Um, and she wanted um, to share this message to parents about the importance of reading to children and the importance of um, broadcasts such as Miss Hope's Reading Hour. So she said, parents, if your children don't see you reading, or you don't read to your children, how will they develop a love for reading? Furthermore, if your child does not read well, how will you cultivate their thirst for knowledge or feed their inquisitive mind or teach them about the world beyond just where they are? But one thing she did say is that over social media, there are a host of reading broadcasts such as Miss Hope's Reading Hour. And if you are here in Philadelphia or if you are anywhere else, there are free libraries all over this country, right? And so like the Free Library of Philadelphia, 
they host children and youth reading events as well. She says she knows that parenting is not easy, but there are a lot of tools to help. And I think about Miss Hope's reading hour as a tool because there may be families that don't have books in the home. And that can be for various reasons. Or, you know, parents work. There's a lot going on right now. So if Miss Hope and Miss Hope's reading hour can help you and you don't have books or you haven't had a chance to buy any or for whatever reason, all you have to do is turn on Miss Hope's reading hour, sit with your children and listen to some great stories, right? Because one of my friends, um, who has a reading disability, he told me something very interesting. He said that he wished he had someone who would read to him when he was younger and how much having someone read aloud to you is really important because you hear how the, how the cadence of words are supposed to sound you hear when you're supposed to stop and when you're supposed to keep going with sentences. You hear all of those things. Like when I do reading lessons with my kids at school, I tell them you have to look, listen, and say. It has everything to do with the eyes, your ears, and your mouth. And they're all connected to being able to be a good reader and have a love for reading. So this is the reason why I do Miss Hope's Reading Hour. Now, I have to work some things out, but there may be another segment of Miss Hope's Reading Hour. I came up with this idea and I will clue you in when we are close to having that new broadcast. It will be only one day a week, but I'm excited about the idea. So when I am close and I figured out all of the logistics, it will look this, it will look a little like it does now, but a little different. And when I bring it to you, you will know why it looks a little different, okay? So I can't wait to tell you all about that. Now, all of that out of the way. Let's get to the books, okay? So, as I told you on Marvelous Monday, we are going to finish this book right here, Old Enough to Save the Planet, Be Inspired by Real Life Children Taking Action Against Climate Change, Old Enough to Save the Planet, written by Lowell Kirby, illustrated by Andalina Lirius. So we're going to finish this one today. Also, I did not know this until I saw it online. And I should have known this because I really love music. I love music. So I should have known this. But April is not only Poetry Appreciation Month, but it is Jazz Appreciation Month. So we will weave a little poetry and a little jazz along with our springy theme into our reading time. So today we will be reading about a famous jazz musician, Duke Ellington. We will read about him. This book is by Andrea Davis Pinckney, illustrated by Brian Pinckney. And it is a Caldecott medal winner. Those medals I keep telling y'all about that you can win even if you're a kid, okay? All right, so, and we learned some new things in this here book. Some new things about Momly that we did not know, okay? We will talk about them when it is time for us to get to Patina. Patty ain't no junk by Jason Reynolds, okay? I was like, what? So we'll get to it when we get to it, okay? 
Now let us get into our first book, Old Enough to Save the Planet by Lowell Kirby. Um, let me that page. And this is a Magic Cat publishing book. So let me get to the last one we had gotten to. Yes, this was the last one. Okay. I know enough to save these. Nine-year-old Unita learned about the importance of pollination while visiting an ancient forest in Kenya where she lives. Her trip inspired her to create a garden near her home that would attract bees and other creatures that help to spread pollen. She has put up signs in her town to explain her work to her community. And she sells seeds to help other people start their own gardens. Bees like to live in areas filled with wildflowers, grasses, and trees. When a bee drinks nectar, the pollen from the flower sticks to the bee's legs. This bee then carries the pollen to the next flower. Without this pollen, new plants can't grow, including those that provide food for us to eat. Bees' habitats are being destroyed, so humans can use land for other things, leaving bees homeless. Unita prepares to plant some wildflowers that will attract bees. Name, Unita Atitwa. Country, Kenya. Change maker for the preservation of bees and education of people about pollination. And right here is Unita. That is a very important thing to make sure bees have habitats because without them, we would not have food to eat. I'm responsible enough to make use of our food waste. Nikita, a 12 year old from Ukraine, decided to make use of the food waste that was being thrown away at his school. Along with a friend, he set up a project to separate food leftovers from other types of trash and then turned them into compost that could be used to nourish the city's plants and trees. Their work was so successful that many other schools around the country have adopted the idea and are using their waste to create their own compost. One way to reduce food waste is to take subtle, um, suitable leftovers, such as bread crusts or apple cores, and find a way to turn them into compost. Compost is made by allowing organic materials such as leaves, twigs, and food waste to slowly decompose. This compost eventually becomes a nutrient-rich fertilizer which can be used to help new plants and trees grow. Compost can be, can be made on a large scale in schools or restaurants or on a smaller scale at home. Nikita empties a bucket of fruit and vegetable peelings into the school compost bin. Name, Nikita Shulga. Country, Ukraine. Change maker four, diverting food waste from landfill into compost projects. Where's Nikita? Right there in the red sweater. That's Nikita. And I actually have a compost bin in my yard. I started it kind of late and I filled it kind of full. So over the winter, I haven't looked in it in a while. So now I'm interested to see what it looks like in there. I'll go and check it out today. I care enough to clean up the ocean. Shalice was 11 years old when she started working to clean up the ocean near where she lives in Australia. She goes down to the beach every weekend to tidy up and make notes on the garbage she finds. She also got her local council to provide special bins for old fishing lines and to put up signs explaining 
how to take better care of marine animals and their habitat. Trash is destroying the world's coral reefs, making them more vulnerable to diseases that damage their health. Fishing lines are very dangerous for marine animals who can get tangled up in them and become seriously injured. It's not just beaches that need cleaning up. Trash from people living inland can find its way out to sea after it ends up in a river that flows into the ocean. It takes hundreds of years for fishing lines and other trash to break down and disappear so it causes a lot of damage if it isn't cleaned up. There are now many garbage patches in our oceans and the largest of these, the Great Pacific Patch, is about the size of Texas. But it is hard to get an accurate measurement. Shalice explains to her friend why it is important to collect trash from the beach. Name, Shalice Leesfield, country, Australia. Change maker for rescuing the ocean from being destroyed by pollution. Wow. Can you believe that? A trash heap in the ocean the size of Texas. Texas is a huge state in the United States. That is amazing. And where is Shalice? Uh, she's right there. There is Shalice. Wow, that is crazy. I'm clever enough to look for palm oil alternatives. Jordan, an 11-year-old from New York, became concerned about the use of palm oil while doing research for a school project on orangutans. He discovered that rainforests are that are home to orangutans are being burned down to make space to grow more oil palms. He, con he contacted lots of companies that used palm oil in their products to ask them to say ask them to say so clearly on their labels so that more people would be aware of the issue. He also set up a website to share his work and encourage others to help. Rainforests are home to a huge number of plant and animal species. So many, in fact, that we haven't even discovered some of them. A large number of everyday food and beauty products contain palm oil, from soap and shampoo to chocolate and bread. Burning down the rainforest to grow more oil palm trees means that lots of species, including orangutans, could die out forever. The smoke that results from burning down the rainforest contains carbon dioxide and other pollutants, which can cause serious pollution problems. Palm oil isn't bad in itself, but we need to be much more careful about how and where it is produced, as well as how many companies use it. Jordan hands a banana to an orangutan who happily plays in its rainforest home. Name, Jordan Sal Salama. Country, United States. Change maker for raising awareness about the impact of palm oil. Wow. And where's Jordan? There's, no, nope, this hand. There's Jordan, right there. Imagine somebody burning down where you live just so they can grow something. Nobody would want that for their home, okay? Now on to our last person. We're dedicated enough to save water. The children at Hengdi Primary School in China wanted to find ways to make their school more environmentally friendly. They worked together to create an ecological field on their school grounds that educated students about water conservation through games and other activities. 
their most important achievement was finding a way to adapt their drainage system so that wastewater could be used to irrigate the small farm areas outside the classroom. All their ideas have been useful and they are still working to find more. Humans cannot survive without water, so there is more demand for it as the world's population grows. Freshwater shortages affect one in three people around the world, mainly in developing countries. Climate change is leading to rising global temperatures that may lead to more droughts, making it even more important to conserve water as much as possible. Whether in school or at home, you can reduce water waste, scraping leftovers and removing grease before washing your plate. At Hengdi, the children are learning how to spray, how a spray nozzle on the end of a tap can slow water flow and reduce waste. Name, Hengdi Primary School, country, China, Change Makers 4, teaching others about water ecology and conservation. How awesome is that? All the children are working together to make sure that they conserve water and teach other people how to do the same. The end. Wow. What amazing young ones starting at age seven. I think the oldest person in these stories was 13 or 14 years old. And in the back of the book, they offer ideas on how you can help to save the planet and 10 things you can do to make your voice heard. So if you are interested in making your voice heard or helping to conserve and save the planet, this is a very good book for you. And for your young ones to show them, listen, it doesn't matter how old you are, you have the power, the ingenuity, and the ideas to make a difference wherever you live, okay? And your difference can make a difference all the way around the world. So that's the reason why I'm wearing my superhero shirt today, because all the young ones in that book are absolutely superheroes. Very good book. So glad I got to read it with you all. Now, let us get into a little jazz, okay? Good jazz. And this is jazz that's about the time when Duke Ellington was out in the world, okay? So we're gonna be reading about Duke Ellington. This book is by Andrea Davis Pinkney. See who the... Oh, it doesn't show. Oh, let's see who the publisher is. Oh, this is and this is a Disney books book. I don't know if it's affiliated with Disney Disney, but I don't know. That's the name of the publishing company. You ever hear of the jazz playing man? The man with the cats who could swing with his band. He was born in 1899 in Washington, D.C., born Edward Kennedy Ellington. But whenever, but wherever young Edward went, he said, hey, call me Duke. Duke's name fit him rightly. He was a smooth talking, slick stepping piano playing kid but his piano playing wasn't always as breezy as his tribe. When Duke's mother, Daisy, and his father, J.E., enrolled him in piano lessons, Duke didn't want to go. Baseball was Duke's idea of fun, but his parents had other notions for their kid. Duke had to start with pian the piano basics. 
his fingers playing the same tired tune. One and two and one and two. Daisy and J.E. made Duke practice day after day. To Duke, one and two wasn't music. He called it an umpy dump sound that was headed nowhere worth following. He quit his lessons and kissed the piano a fast goodbye. Wow, I did not know that. He was not interested in the piano at first. News to me. Years later, on a steamy summer night, Duke heard that Umpy Dump played in a whole new way. Folks called the music ragtime. Piano that turned Umpy Dump into soul rousing rump. The ragtime music set Duke's fingers to wiggling. Soon he was back at the piano, trying to plunk out his own ragtime rhythm. One and two and one and two. At first, this was the only crude tinkling Duke knew. Yeah, because he had stopped practicing the piano. So he had to start back at the beginning. But with practice, all Duke's fingers rode the piano keys. Duke started to play his own made up melodies, whole notes, chords, sharps and flats, left-handed hops and right-handed slides. Believe it, man, Duke taught himself to press on the pearlies like no one else could. His one and two umpy dump became a thing of the past. Now, playing the piano was all, I'm sorry, playing the piano was Duke's all-time love. When Duke was 19, he was entertaining ladies and gents at parties, pool halls, country clubs, and cabarets. He had finest pie looks and flashy threads. He was a ladies man with flared spare. And whenever a pretty skinned beauty leaned on Duke's piano, he played his best music. Composition smoother than a hairdo sleeked with pomade. Oh, he was pretty flashy. <laughs> it wasn't long before Duke formed his own small band, a group of musicians who played all over Washington, D.C. But soon they split the D.C. scene and made tracks for New York City, for Harlem, the place where jazz music ruled. They called themselves the Washington, the Washingtonians and performed in all kinds of New York City honky-tonks. Barron's Exclusive, The Plantation, Ciro's, and The Kentucky Club. Folks got to know the band by name and came to hear them play. Honky-tonks are clubs. Places where you go to listen to swing and music. Then on an autumn day in 1927, Lady Luck smiled pretty on the Washingtonians. They were asked to play at the Cotton Club, Harlem's swankiest, hot, swankiest hangout, a big time night spot. The Cotton Club became a regular gig for Duke and his band. They grew to 12 musicians and changed their name to Duke Ellington and his orchestra. Night after night, they played their music, which was broadcast live over the radio. That's just like playing your music and getting on TV now, okay? For all those homebodies out in radio lover's land, Folks who only dreamed of sitting pretty at the cotton. The show helped them feel like they were out on the town. Duke's Creole love call 
was spicier than a pot of jambalaya. His mood indigo was a musical stream that swelled over the airwaves. <laughs> Sometimes the orchestra performed their tunes straight up, but other nights, when the joint started to jump, Duke told his band to play whatever came to mind, to improvise their solos, to make the music fly, and they did. Each instrument raised its own voice, one by one. Each cat took the floor and wiped it clean with his own special way of playing. Sonny Greer pounded out the bang of jump rope feet on the street with his snare drum, a subway beat on his bass drum, a sassy ride on his cymbal. Sonny's percussion was smooth and steady. Sometimes only his drumsticks made the music, cracking out the rattly beat of wood slapping wood. Wow. That description made you feel like you were there. Along with Sonny, Joe Tricky Sam Nanton, in that nickname, went to work on his trombone, sliding, sliding smooth melodic gold. He stretched the notes to their full tilt pushing and pulling their tropical lilt. When Tricky Sam was through, he'd nod to Otto Toby Hardwick. Your turn, he'd say. Take the floor, daddy-o. That was a cool name you would call your friends. Daddy-o. <laughs> Toby let loose on his sleek brass sax, curling his notes like a kite tail in the wind. A musical loop-de-loop -loop with a serious twist. There he is with his saxophone. When I was little, I wanted to play the saxophone. I don't know why. I just wanted to play the saxophone. Last came James Bubber Miley, a one-of-a-kind horn, horn player. He could make his trumpet wail like a man whose blues were deeper than the deep blue sea. To stir up the sound of his low moan horn, Bubber turned out a growl from way down in his throat. His gut bucket tunes put a spell on the room. Wow. And you see the thing he's holding? It's actually like a musical instrument, but it looks like the end, the um, rubber end of a plumber, a plunger, sorry. And it changes the sound of the trumpet. Yeah, their solos, those solos were kicking. Hot buttered bop with lots of sassy cool tunes. When the band did their thing, the Cotton Club, performers danced the Black Bottom, the Fishtail, and the Susie Q. And while they were cutting the rug, dancing, Duke slid his honey-colored fingertips across the ivory 88s, meaning the keys of the piano. Because if you didn't know, there are 88 keys on the piano. Look at all of them dancing in their fancy clothes. The word on Duke and his band spread from New York to Macon to Kalamazoo and on to the sunshiny Hollywood Hills. 
the whole country would swoon to Duke's beat. Once folks got a taste of Duke's sweet soul music, they hurried to the record stores asking, yo, you got the Duke? Slide me some King of the Keys, please. Gonna play me that piano prince and his band? People bought Duke's records, thousands of them. In 1939, Duke hired Billy Strayhorn, a musician who wrote songs. Billy became Duke's ace, his main man, his best friend. Duke and Billy worked as a team. Together, they composed unforgettable music. Billy's song, Take the A Train, was one of the greatest hits in 1941. With the tunes that he and Billy wrote, Duke painted colors with his band sound. He could, he could swirl the butterscotch tones of Tricky Sam's horn with the silver notes of the alto saxophones. And oh, those clarinets. Duke could blend their red hot blips with a purple dash of brass from the trumpet section. In time, folks said Duke Ellington's real instrument wasn't his piano at all. It was his orchestra. Most people called his music jazz, but Duke called it the music of my people. And to celebrate the history of African-American people, Duke composed a special suite called Black, Brown, and Beige a suite that rocked the bosom and lifted the soul. Black, brown, and beige sang the glories of dark skin, the pride of African heritage, and the triumphs of black people from the days of slavery to the years of the civil rights struggle. Look at the colors of that music. Duke introduced Black, Brown, and Beige at New York's Carnegie Hall, a symphony hall so grand that even the seats were velvet. Few African Americans had played at Carnegie Hall before. Duke and his orchestra performed on January 23rd, 1943. Outside, the winter wind was cold and slapping, but inside, Carnegie Hall was sizzling with applause. Duke had become a master maestro. Because of Duke's genius, his orchestra now had music, a musical mix like no other. Now you've heard of the jazz playing man, the man with the cats who could swing with his band, King of Keys, Piano Prince, Edward Kennedy, and Ellington, the Duke. Wow. The end. Wow, what an awesome story. Especially when you think about the fact that he didn't even want to play the piano. And I actually love Duke Ellington's music. There is an editor's, I mean, an author's note, but it's a little long to read for right now. So you will have to get the book. This book would be really good for those young ones who actually have piano practice. And they're like, I don't want to do this anymore to learn about Duke Ellington. Because sometimes when you first start learning music, whether it's vocal music or instrumental music, sometimes the first lessons are a little boring. And you're like, I have to do these vocal exercises. Me, 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 ba, 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 ba. Ooh, like 
those are some vocal exercises. And then you have to do that. They're like, I thought I, we were supposed to be singing. You're like, that is singing. If you can perfect those things, it'll be noticeable in your singing. And sometimes you're like, oh, I don't think so. Until you hear the difference in how you sound. It's just like with musical instruments. Sometimes you're only using two fingers at first, but you're exercising those fingers so you can learn how to exercise the rest of them. Sometimes when you're learning the drums, you're hitting a block going pep, 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 pep. But if you can learn that, then you can learn all the other stuff that they do going all over the place on the drums. So if you have a young one who has to learn an instrument or is doing vocal music, Duke Ellington would be a good book for them. So glad we got to read that. Now, my friends, let us get to our girl. We got to talk about our girl, Patina. We got to talk about our girl, Patina, y'all. So we are still in chapter nine. We're actually about to be done with chapter nine, as a matter of fact. Oh, no, it's chapter 10. We're about to be done with chapter 10. So apparently... Um, Momley actually went to Chester Academy. Can you believe it? I was like, what? She went to the school that you go to now, Patina? You and your sister? Now, Patina, she didn't think Momley really understood. She really didn't ever think she really understood like what she was going through with having to live with her and Uncle Tony in the situation with her mom. But Momly actually understood more than she thought. Momly had went through a similar situation with her mother where her mother had gotten sick. And then she was working as custodial staff at Chester Academy. And that's the reason why she was able to go there for free. Then her mom fell ill. And so her mom couldn't work there anymore. But the good thing that Momley's grades were good. And remember her favorite patient that Momley has in her, um, in her home health care business, Mr. Warren? Well, come to find out, Mr. Warren was the person who replaced her mother as custodial staff at Chester Academy. And he was so nice to her. He allowed her to still work with him because of course she couldn't work on her own. She was only 12, but he was a person who was a comforter to her and treated her very kind. And that's why other than my, um, Patina's mother, Mr. Um, Warren is her favorite patient because of how he took care of her in her hard situation. And now she enjoys being able to take care of him. So my friends, let me, let me get myself together. Let me get comfortable. Okay. So we can get back and learn some more about mom Lee. Oh yes. And guess what else we learned? <laughs> that the girls, T and T, their mothers work at the school as teachers. So they're not so frou-frou as they act like they are. But we will get back to that when we get back to school. So I want to see what happens when they get back to school and what they're going to say about Becca. Because you remember how it was with her room, with the whole black room and everything. Anywho, let's get back to the story. All right, so we are at the end of chapter 10 in Patina, Patty Ain't No Junk by Jason Reynolds. Okay. 
But I saw my mom on the weekends, Momly picked at a cuticle, gave it a tear. Then one day I showed up after school, ready for my daily task. And Mr. Warren said that he didn't have anything for me. And when I asked him why not, he said because he didn't have a task nearly as important as the one I was avoiding. Wait, that's not exactly what he said. What he really said was, Momly held her finger out and screwed her face to imitate an old man. Folks who try to do everything are usually avoiding one thing. And was he right? I asked, folding my arms across my chest. Was he right? Momly picked up the last two glasses from the counter held them up to the light, no spots, then put them up in the cabinet. He definitely was, but I didn't know it at the time. I mean, I was 12 and couldn't figure out how to deal with the fact that my mother wasn't the same, you know? Yeah, and guess what? The old man is still teaching me stuff. Even the other day, when he was sort of out of it, going on about buffing the floors. Momly's face brightened, laughter tapped behind her lips. All I could think was that he thinks he can do things that he just, he just can't do anymore. In his mind, he's strong enough to push a buffer. But you know, if he really wants to clean that floor, we can do it together. And that's okay. Chapter 11. To do. Get there. There's nothing else I can do. The next morning, Momly dropped me off. But only me. Maddie had spent the whole ride telling me how milking cows didn't scare her. And how if the milk don't come out like it's supposed to. She'll just pick the whole cow up and shake the milk out of it. Yup, farm day had finally arrived. Have fun, I said, climbing out of the car at the exact moment. The exact same moment Becca was walking between Momley's car and the car in front of us. We did, did a weird wave thing. And then I turned back to Maddie. You getting up front? I asked. Not really serious, but Momly cut me off anyway. No, Patty, she's not, she said with an unusual snap. Momly ain't no, f Momly ain't have no funk in her. No sit down, no finger point, no talk through teethness, none of that. But she didn't do the Maddie in the front seat thing. Maddie could kick the front seat all day, every day, could put a hole in it and everything, and Momly would be cool. But not this. Come on, Momly, please. I did it yesterday, Maddie begged. Mommy turned around in her seat and looked Maddie in the face. You're not old enough yet, sweetheart. That little bit of snap was gone and she was back to sweet Momly, even though she was still saying no. Patty, what you want me to do? I shrugged. Look, you'll be up front soon enough. And then all you want to do is wish you were in the back. So chill and enjoy your limo ride to the farm, Waffle. I tried not to laugh while closing the door and throwing up the peace sign. This is going to sound silly, but when I walked into school, into the school, the hallway seemed different. Just knowing that Momly used to clean the floors of Chester, used to make it shiny every day just so it could get all scuffed up and dirty again. The same way she did our house, her car, and everything else made my mind do flips, thinking thoughts it never thought before. I was looking down at the floor, the light shining off of it, looking down like usual, but for a different reason today. 
At my locker, Becca was waiting for me, wearing a weirdo smile, holding a piece of paper. Hey, I said, surprised she was there. Hey, so last night, I was looking for more cool stuff about Frida, and I decided to just do something silly and Google Frida Kahlo and space, just to see, just to see, you know? I wasn't really expecting nothing, but listen to this. Becca held the paper up and read, a constellation that exists only on paper is useless. She slapped the note down to her side. I gave her a blank stare, a so what face, which is when Becca yipped. Frida said that, but what does it mean? I have no idea, but she said it. Me and Becca laughed and I'm going to think about it because maybe we can use it for the project. I nodded, smiled. Then I'll think about it too. Sweet. By the way, your little sister is the cutest. Then Becca held up two fingers like Maddie and said all corny and awkward. Peace. Peace. That's the opposite of what came knocking on the door at the very end of homeroom. Miss Stanfield had taken roll and the morning announcements happened, which was usually about permission slips and the day's lunch menu. Sesame chicken. Yes, one of my favorite things to eat. My stomach started growling as soon as I heard those two words come crackling through the intercom. So excited. And then Jasmine Stanger made her own morning announcement that she had to take her belly button ring out. She lifted her shirt. Her belly button had turned into an alien and my stomach stopped growling. After the announcements and before the bell rang, the intercom speaker came buzzing back on. Mrs. Stansfield? Miss Durden's voice came growling through. Miss Durden worked at the front desk in the office, had a face like a baby doll and a voice like a car engine. Yes? Can you please send Patina Jones to the office? Her uncle's here to pick her up. My uncle? To pick me up? Why? What? I jumped up, grabbed my bag and headed for the door. As I walked down the hallway, I could see Uncle Tony pacing back and forth. Uncle Tony? When he turned toward me, his face looked like there was ice under his skin. Patty, what are you doing here? My heart was pounding even before he said what he said. The thing you never want to hear. Something I'd heard before and never wanted to hear again. Something's happened. Something's happened. The bell rang. What? What happened? I asked, already heading for the doors as my classmates poured into the hallway. Homeroom was over. My legs felt heavy and my body was doing what it does when I run. But I wasn't running. I was walking. But it didn't really feel like I was doing that either. I was just moving. I'll tell you in the car. Uncle Tony grabbed my hand, squeezed it as he led the way. Is it Ma? Is something wrong with Ma? There was something about him holding my hand. Something about that moment that made everything around me fade into streaks of yellow, brown, and pinks. The hallway muted in my head. I could only hear my uncle. We've got to get to the hospital. He answered, steering me toward his SUV. He broke into a jog. We have to go. We have to go. To the hospital? To the hospital? Unmute. One second, a teenage noise explosion before barreling through the double doors. The hospital? I cried out. Uncle Tony, what's going on? What's wrong with Ma? But he didn't respond until we were in his SUV. He jammed the key into the ignition and pulled away from the curb. And before I could ask again, he looked me square in the face. 
Your mother is fine, he confirmed finally. And I could breathe, but only one breath, because then Uncle Tony said, but Momley and Maddie were in an accident. What, what do, what do you mean, Momley and, and Maddie? What are you talking about? It was hard to find the words because it was hard to find breath. My whole body felt like it had been emptied out. Like I ain't have bones or blood or nothing inside. Uncle Tony repeated, I don't know how else to say it, Patty. They, they were in a car accident. Oh, well, my friends, we will end there. I'm so sorry to leave you on a cliffhanger, but I will leave you there. Whoa. So, she had just left Maddie and Momley, went into the school, did homeroom at the beginning of the day. And then Uncle Tony comes to pick her up and says, Momley and Maddie have been in a car accident on the way to the farm. Oh, well, we are going to have to wait until Marvelous Monday to find out what happened to Momley and Maddie. Oh, I hope they're okay. Woo. Well, my friends, we are at the end of Miss Hope's reading hour on this fabulous Friday. I'm so happy that I was able to be here with you this evening to read these awesome books. Of course, Jazz Appreciation Month, learning and reading about Duke Ellington, learning about the superheroes and change makers who are working to save our planet and the environment. These young ones between seven years old and 14 years old who has started organizations and movements just to help save the environment and animals and the planet. So glad we got to read those books today. And I will get back to you about a new segment that is coming to Miss Hope's Reading Hour until Marvelous Monday, my friends. I look forward to seeing you then. Have a great weekend. Here in Philly, it might be a little rainy, but there's a whole lot of fun things you can do in the rain when you're in the house, even outside. So I hope that you have a wonderful, safe, and happy, healthy weekend. And I look forward to seeing you again on our Marvelous Monday broadcast. Until then, my friends, enjoy the rest of your fabulous Friday. I will see you again on Marvelous Monday, right here on Miss Hope's Reading Hour. Until then.